one. Hey everybody, my name's Arnaldo Offerman. I'm Dane Holman. And I'm Kevin Hallmark. Uh, guys, thank you again for tuning in. This is actually going to be a little bit more than just a traditional show for about DJs. This is really for anybody that loves text, use computer, and most importantly, that uses Apple. Uh, before we continue, you know, I mean, I've been using Apple for a hell of a long time. I mean, I still have a Newton laying around somewhere. I've got the original iMac. I have, I, I actually started with like the old school PowerBook, the, I want to say the 2CS, one of the first mm -hmm. color ones. Uh, Dane, what do you do for a living and how long have you been a uh, Mac user? Um, well, I, I met, I'm back and forth with Mac and PC, but uh, I, I work in IT. I'm an IT director for insurance for, firm. Uh, been working in IT for years and seen a little of everything. <laughs> and uh, Kevin? So I'm, I'm a professional computer programmer. I've been using Mac since I was about four years old, which is about uh, 28, or I, yeah, 28 years now, <laughs> something like that. So quite a long time. Um, I'm really dedicated to the Mac. I've been to Macworld a few times back in the 90s. I've been to four WWDCs. Macs are what I do. Um, I build Mac and iOS applications. So I, I'm a Mac guy. And what, what, did they, didn't you like just recently start the first mosh pit at WWDC? That's that's a pretty big accomplishment. Yeah, I was pretty happy for that. I mean, Apple always has, uh, you know, like great bands come and play for us at WWC DC, and this year we had Good Charlotte, and so um, everyone rocked it. It was a great time. That's yeah. awesome. So the reason that I kind of want to mention why we that we've used Apple for this long is because we're pretty angry at Apple right now. Yeah. And um, this isn't just a oh they took something away. You know, Apple's been doing this for a long time, and we've talked about this before. They removed the floppy drive because it was time to go. Steve Jobs took Flash out of, you know, the basic install of OS X, and he looked right at him and said, Adobe, they're a bunch of lazy programmers, and he just went on this whole rant. But now it seems that Johnny Ive has pretty much, and Tim Cook has this pretty much said, you know what, we're just going to get rid of every functional thing, have a million different SKUs, and let's just see what, you know, we'll mm -hmm. throw everything at the wall and see what sticks. Kevin, I know you recently had a lot to say about the million SKUs and everything else. Uh, yeah, they're kind of making the same mistake Apple made in the late 80s and early 90s. Instead of focusing on a few products really well, like mm -hmm. Apple, um, Steve Jobs always presented that quad matrix of products that Apple focused on. Mm -hmm. And um, they've really lost focus on that, just like they did in the late 80s. They introduced Performas and Quadras and all these different mm -hmm. lines that didn't really have a market. And they're doing the same thing again with the MacBook Pro today. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. And before we talk about all the other products, I mean, the MacBook Pro, I think, is the one that I really want to start off with, because especially a lot of the viewers here, almost everybody uses the Mac Pro as far mm -hmm. as, you know, the Mac user line. And as much as I love my iPad Pro and I love my MacBook Pro, I think Apple forgot what Pro is supposed mm -hmm. to stand like, you know, stand for. Uh, you know, I still use the 2012. I refuse to just go anything newer than 2012. I don't like embedded RAM. I don't I use like the 2011. Yeah, you know, and that was that was a great machine too. I mean, well, other than the GPU issue, but to this day, they'll mm. still fix that GPU issue. Uh, but the 2016 MacBook Pro, okay, fine. It's it's got the Touch Bar, and oh, how do you guys feel about the Touch Bar? You know, what I mean, I, I feel I, it's gimmicky, but it's cool. It, it's gimmicky. It, it it tries to distract you, I think, from what it's missing. I definitely agree with you, Dane. Uh, the biggest problem, too, is there's no feedback. Like when you yeah. touch a keyboard, you expect no haptic feedback at all. Exactly. And that's a huge mistake on Apple's part. Uh, yeah. That's it. And, you know, okay, so I don't know about you guys. Like for me, I want the big, the biggest keys possible. You know, like <laughs> on my Christmas wish list, I want, uh, what's it called, mechanical keyboard, but I want the loudest, clickiest keyboard <laughs> I can find. Mm -hmm. I, I, I've played with the new MacBook Pros, and I feel like, the next MacBook Pro isn't even of a keyboard. It's just going to be a dual screen because that mm -hmm. keys, those keys are so flat. It feels like you're typing on glass. I mean, have, have you, Kevin, yeah. you've played with it already, right? Yeah, I mean, I used the the MacBook Butterfly keyboard, and I was not a fan at all. Uh, but I did not mind the new MacBook Pro as much. I, I could touch type on it. I had really good action. That wasn't a big problem for me. But the big issue is the lack of escape key. I, I don't know mm -hmm. what Apple was yeah. thinking. Um, yeah. yeah they're, they're pro users. I mean, I use that in lots of pro applications, Xcode, and you know other things. And I need that physical key. No, abs yeah. absolutely. I, I guess you know. I, okay, I get the idea of the Touch Bar. You know, you can have easy access. But 
unless you're video editing, most of us have been using Apple for a while, pretty much just use shortcut keys. You know, I, yeah. I, I barely go to the menu anymore. I don't know how you guys are, but I've, I never touched a menu. And, ooh, you can DJ with it. Are you freaking kidding me right now? Like, that Not was the big well. thing. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, they, they made it that everybody in their bedroom can DJ with it. <laughs> and, 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 okay, to be fair, you know, like, like Kevin said, if it had feedback, I think I would be more apt. Like, I'll be yeah. honest with you. When I saw it, I'm like, okay, this does look really cool. I mean, they actually look like little keys. And I remember, I can't remember who used to make it. There used to be a keyboard with the LED keys inside um, each one. The Maximus? Something like that. Kevin, do you know which one I'm talking about by any chance? I'm not quite familiar with it. it uh, I was expensive. trying to think. It, it was it was an expensive key, uh, or keyboard, to say at the least. But Oh, yeah. <laughs> but, but Okay, so... You know, okay, so let's get that part, you know, aside. Find Optimi it. it was the Optimus Maximus keyboard. Uh, yeah, something like that. Sounds like a transformer, but I, <laughs> I, I, I can forgive the keyboard. I'll be honest with you. I don't like the keyboard, but I, I can forgive that. I can forgive the whole USB-C thing because there are some cool things about USB-C that a lot of us may not have thought about in the long run. Number one is not having to spend $80 every time that that stupid adapter frayed out of the end. Mm -hmm. You know, it's nice that I can charge from another computer or I can charge with a battery pack or I can even, you know, put two. Ad Apparently, you can put two adapters and charge a MacBook Pro with two adapters. Whether it does mm -hmm. it faster or not, it's a different story. Um, I, I can even get away with having to use a dongle for a USB stick, which is a problem. But here's my question for you guys, especially, you know, Kevin, since you're a programmer, I don't know if you get a chance to really play with the hardware development side of things, but do you see a lot of manufacturers doing USB-C for everything, including USB sticks. I mean, I think right now this is another case of Apple pushing the envelope in the right way. The USB-C connector was designed by mm -hmm. Apple. Um, you know, they gave it to the USB consortium, and I think that was a good choice mm -hmm. to push people away from it. It, it is the future. Um, it, it really is actually nice when you start using it. You you don't have to worry about as many cords and connectors. Imagine just one cord that does everything, whereas right now you have micro B and micro B3 and all the different proliferations. So I think that's actually a good choice, and I think other manufacturers are going to follow suit, um, especially with some of the Google Chromebooks, I believe, are also USB-C only. So I think I think it's going to start spreading out over the product line as more adapters become available. Mm -hmm. I know Dell has already integrated and pretty most of their line. Early 2017, you're going to see their whole line having it, but they're still keeping USB 3.0 on there for the time being, but I foresee in the next year you'll start seeing that stuff go away so you don't think it's gonna be like thunderbolt where it was the next great best thing and then nobody ever wind up using it no i think there's already enough adoption from it i mean by merging usb with thunderbolt and all those different technologies because it carries display port and hdmi it really makes hardware simpler for manufacturers yeah instead of having to design for a bunch of ports they just put five USB C ports on there and they get everything out of them does, yeah. do, you, do you know if the Thunderbolt 3 over USB-C, if it terminates at, uh, what's it called, at DisplayPort? So, for example, if I have, you know, my Thunderbolt 2 dock, it's got two Thunderbolt outs, but the moment that I plug in a Thunderbolt to DisplayPort adapter, the HDMI stops working, and so does the second Thunderbolt. Is that going to be an issue with the USB-C? Has anybody tested that at all? Um, I haven't seen the USB-C dock yet. I know if I get a 2016 MacBook Pro, which I'm kind of on the fence about, I have a 2012 also, um, I may, I'll may i get a dock with it. So I, I'll have more information then. Cool. It's, we, it's too early to say. We're running a Dell uh, USB-C uh, dock right now at work. We're doing testing with it. And it, it's been running pretty great. I, everyone seems to like them. So that leads us to the next part and I, I will go individual hardware in just a minute because this is my biggest rant why is the hard drive integrated what, I mean, how do you feel about that this, I don't like the I, SSD I don't like it I think this is uh, Apple holding people hostage again I'm going to have to agree with you, Dane, um, especially considering the lowest end 13 inch that's the same new form factor just without a touch bar has the um you know has the removable hard drive mm -hmm. the only thing i can think of is that the haptic and or not haptic but the electronics for the touch bar are taking up space they need uh yeah in, in the device to have the socket but personally i don't think there's a good reason i'd have to look at the mac fix it to see how things are fitting in there though yeah 
I, I guess that's the thing. When I hear pro, I don't expect it to be super thin. You know, my 2012 is as thin enough as I need it. I don't need it to be thinner than a Mac Air. You know, the Mac Air, great. It fits inside a manila envelope. That's the magic mm -hmm. trick about it. I, I want to be able to have the option of removing hard drives or, you know, because I guess the way that I see it is, we all know Apple is notorious for releasing motherboards that every now and then like to crash or logic boards, as they call it. You know, happened with the 2000 and what, the five iBook. That was just a lemon all around. Mm -hmm. The 2011, they still have the recall going on for those computers. Uh, the 2012, 2013 retinas also have a logic board failure issue. So basically that means that if you wind up having, you know, even let's say your Wi-Fi card goes out, you got to send everything, including your data. And I I've got a problem with that. Yeah, and okay, so yes, Apple has this little, I guess there's a little device that literally taps into the logic board and you can extract your data. But guess what? You got to pay for they it. They have it. Yeah, it's not they like you can back it up yourself. Mm -hmm. So I got a problem with that. And I think like and, you said, is well, they're, they're holding people hostage for money now. Well, especially when you're talking about the MacBook Pro supposed to be for, you know, producers, for business, you know what businesses are going to want to use a computer that they have to send back for service and oh they have to send back their data with it you know my company personally we will not send anything back that has a hard, hard drive of ours in it because that's our proprietary data dane is absolutely right yeah. there it's a huge security risk um i like the biggest issue i have is that when i'm done with the hard drive i destroy it i take mm -hmm. a open it up I take a hammer and I destroy the platters so that they are completely broken. For an SSD, I destroy it completely. Mm -hmm. And I can't do that. The only way I can do that with the new MacBook Pro is destroying the entire logic board. Yeah. And so I can't put it, you know, I don't sell a computer with the, a hard drive I've used in it. I buy a new hard drive. So I can't, I can't resell my 2016 MacBook Pro. Do you think Apple is kind of banking on the whole FBI debacle? to make you think that your data really is safe with them if you do have to mail in a MacBook. Because after all that played through, and I didn't even think about the security part of it until Dane had mentioned that, now I'm wondering if Apple really hyped up this whole we're not going to give info to the FBI that easily mm -hmm. so people feel that their data is safe with Apple, especially now that it has that fingerprint scanner on the new MacBook. I think no matter what, your data is not safe with anyone. Oh, absolutely. But I'm wondering if that's what Apple's kind of banking on. Yeah. Actually, I just figured out why the hard drive can't be removed, guys. Oh, why is that? So, so okay, on the on the iPhone. So I've done a lot of work with jailbreaking and trying to, uh, you know, get into the internals of the iPhone. And the way they secure data with the secure enclave and Touch ID, all the encryptographic keys for File Vault are are built in to that secure enclave and it's all part mm. of the encryption process and so they probably need those chips in that hardware to interface with the same kind of system like i mean they, they obviously ported that from the iphone so yeah. maybe it's a limitation of that design like the iphone has a fixed hard drive so do you know so does it have to i mean and it does in in one respect increase security because like apple couldn't get into that san bernardino shooters phone mm -hmm. so it, it it remains to be seen once we get our hands and start researching and uh, trying to hack it, basically, mm -hmm. and to see, you know, maybe maybe it is improving security quite a bit, just like the secure enclave did. When you actually have that local hardware uh, encryption. So, I mean, I guess the only thing that I'm, I, you know, I, I've tried really hard as an Apple lemming to literally keep forgiving things. The hard drive thing, I just have a hard time forgiving that. But I guess if USB-C is fast enough, could you, you know, like for example, my, my, my wife's computer, the uh, hard drive cable actually died inside it. So I literally strapped an external drive to the back of her computer. It was just plugged into USB 3 and she booted from it and used it as her normal computer. Mm -hmm. Is USB-C fast enough that you wouldn't notice much difference between the USB-C connection on a hard drive and the embedded hard drive? Yeah, I don't think you'd notice much difference at all. I actually have a Samsung 840 Evo external drive with USB-C, and I can boot off that, and it feels like I've booted off my internal SSD. Mm -hmm. So I guess for those of you watching, you know, if you are kind of like wondering back and forth, hey, what's my backup? Because, again, with my computer, I have the two drives. While I would never say to anybody, hey, use Mirror One as a backup solution, if you're somewhere and you need your computer and a hard drive dies on you, and one day it will, at least I have a backup ready to go right then and there, uh, give or take. 
but you could somewhat boot off that external drive if you need it to. And if you guys don't know that, or don't know about that, most Apple computers, you can install OS X, you can even clone your hard drive to an external drive and immediately boot and continue using it from there. Uh, we've got a couple quick questions. So Trevor asked, or it's more of a statement, but one of the bad things is now you don't have the MagSafe. Uh, so if you pull in the charger, it could bend or break. And somebody yeah. actually did a video that shows like he yanked the USB-C and it completely bent the metal on the MacBook Pro. But now I want to say it's Belkin that made a USB-C MagSafe adapter. I don't know if you guys yeah, have seen, seen that. that. It's pretty nice. Yeah. So Trevor, mm -hmm. that one it was also one of my concerns, especially, you know, when you're out, you know, if you're... I, I, again, you know, my MacBook is my life, you know, I mean, I'll bring it everywhere with me and it's always in the middle of an event or if I'm at the airport or at a restaurant that somebody always winds up yanking the cord out entirely. Uh, don't ask why my laptop's plugged in in a restaurant. This is really my sad life. Uh, <laughs> but there are, you know, solutions for that. GS Lighting Solution asks, do you think Apple will head down the road of what Microsoft is doing with forced installs and invasion of privacy? Hmm. I would say it's too soon to say anything about invasion of privacy, hmm. but as, for, as far as forest installs, I don't know. What do you guys think? Dane, Kevin? Um, I sure hope not. Uh, Apple's always been pretty loose about that. Mm -hmm. they, um, they've never forced an upgrade like Microsoft has, but they also don't have the problem Microsoft had of, you know, everyone was staying on Windows 7 because they didn't like Windows yeah. 8. Um, you know, and so they kind of had to push people like my, my father-in-law is still using Windows XP. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Microsoft has to kind of push people along to the latest version or they can't advance their platform. Yeah. So I think it was kind of a, a desperation move on Microsoft's part, but that's all Microsoft is a whole nother conversation. My, yeah. Microsoft's always had a problem with adoption rates and, uh, you know, they've improved over the last few years, but part of that is because they've gotten with hardware manufacturers and kind of force that where it's like you don't have a choice. Apple, you know, I, I think you're gonna see jumping off you're gonna see Microsoft doing the same thing that Apple's been doing. You know, with Windows ten, Windows ten is <laughs> supposed to be the last Windows operating system. Wait, what? It's essentially supposed to be the last operating system from Microsoft. And what they're gonna do is they're gonna go the route of how Apple's handled it and just re revisions of it. They're gonna continue updating, but they're still gonna call it Windows ten. The okay. look of it's not going to change very much, but showing improvements. And I think that's why Apple has been successful because they get that adoption rate where people think, okay, the operating system's staying about the same. I'm just getting a few new features. Okay, why not? You know, it's actually funny that you mentioned that because I have a 2006 Mac Pro underneath me and I installed Tiger. And when you look at Tiger and, and even Sierra, seat. they look relatively the same. But then when you actually use it, you don't realize how much Apple has very mm -hmm. subtly changed over the years. Mm -hmm. Like, it's not even remotely... Like, to me, I thought, oh, this should look the same. Like, holy crap, I can't remember how to do anything. Half these features are gone. But then Apple likes to slip things that I don't like. And I learned this by accident by calling 911. Did you know that if you hold the button down on your Apple Watch for 10 yep. seconds, instead of rebooting it now, it dials 911? Yep. Yeah, there's an option when you set up now yeah. about it. And I'm like, why do I want that? Because I'm going to be sitting here like oh. this, and I'm going to bump it, and it's going to call. Well, I can tell you right now, I never actually opened the Apple Watch app, so I never saw that feature. I, my Apple Watch froze. I'm holding it down, trying to reboot it, and it says, <laughs> call an emergency services. Hang one, one. I'm like, oh, shit, what the hell? <laughs> <laughs> at, at some point, that would have been really nice to know. Hey, just so you know, you're about to call 911. Yeah, yeah that'd be great. Uh, so, I mean, that... I don't think Apple's going to force us to go into updates, but they are going to force features on there. But now here's the part that scares me. How long till, because I, I, I can confidently, at least I feel that I can confidently say that the 2011 and 2012 MacBooks, there might be more users of those and even the Mac Minis than mm -hmm. some of the newer MacBook Pros or Mac Minis. Uh, the, I want to say it's a 2012 Mac Mini that has a more powerful processor than the 2015 or 16, mm -hmm. if I'm not mistaken. How yes. long till Apple says, okay, we're going to stop supporting those altogether, no more operating system updates to force them to go into the newer ones? Mm -hmm. I mean, Apple has been actually really good about updates over time, yeah. um, though that was, may have been more jobs. Like I have a 2007 MacBook Pro, the original core duo, or two duo, sitting next to me running El Capitan. Um, Apple mm -hmm. has really clear guidelines on when they obsolete and then uh, make like I forget the other term, but they basically, after five years and then seven years, uh, they're obsolete and then retired, so they don't mm -hmm. sell or support them. So that's when I ex expect to see uh, the Mac OS get dropped. Mm -hmm. uh, like a bunch of uh, 
uh, computers go obsolete at the end of the year, and I don't think we'll see those supported by the next version of macOS, which I think is going to be macOS 11 to match iOS 11. Mm-hmm. That was the other thing. Is like I feel and like it's gonna be, sorry, go ahead. It's going to be a big year or two for Apple next year, depending on how they pull it off, especially when you're done with iOS devices when you're coming up on the anniversary. It, it, it's weird because I think. There's a lot of speculation. I mean, now there's speculation about the iPhone 8 that it's going to completely sell out and bring Apple back up. But has anybody not noticed that the iPhone 7, you can't even go to the store and still pick one up? So they mm-hmm. seem to be doing pretty good with that. Either that well, or they're holding supplies back. They're holding supplies back. I, I mean, I, I didn't have trouble Apple getting an plus. iPhone 7 at all. Plus. My, my, Me either. Just the plus. Yeah. Well, and you know what? You know what? Because... Yeah, the iPhone 7, I, I prefer the form factor of the traditional 6 as opposed to the 6 Plus, but I really wanted that dual camera. I'm like, okay, that, that's, that's pretty damn cool. So I wound up getting the 7 Plus. Now that it's weird, is I'm really like comfortable using that. Mm-hmm. And now I hold a 6, I'm like, how the hell did I ever use a phone this small? But, oh, I know. But I guess my, yeah. my the thing is that, yeah, eventually Apple is going to stop supporting the 2011, 2012. I'm going to be sad as hell about it. I'm going to find a way to freaking hack it if I need to because – you can mm-hmm. hack the 2006 uh, Mac Pro, I guess the original Mac Pro tower, to run newer OSs. So I'm mm-hmm. sure you can do that with the newer ones. But if they do, the question is, you know, at what point, why, hardware-wise? You know, and Kevin, I know that we've talked about this on Facebook before. I'm not happy with the firmware cho- or the hardware choices they're doing. I, I don't get oh, no. the terrible AMD uh, choice of, uh, for GPU. I don't get why they're not using DDR4. Yeah, mm-hmm. six, 16 gigs of RAM. Okay, yeah, 16 gigs is more than what most people need. But if you're running multiple virtual machines, having 32 is a godsend. But when we're talking about a pro and we're talking about this is a new computer coming out in 2016. Exactly. I mean, 16 gigs was standard, you know, how many years ago now? So, you know, they're not really being innovative or creative at that point. So, okay, so let's talk about RAM first because this was one of the questions that came in. How important is the speed of the RAM right now in the 2016 Mac Pro for the performance that it should deliver? Because, you know, yes, there's faster RAM out there, but is that really mm-hmm. going to be that big of an issue as opposed to the fact that you're only capped at 16 gigs? The speed's not an issue. It's the size. Mm-hmm. I routinely only have a gig and a half of RAM free, and just running my development environment, you know, that's the iOS simulator, Xcode, and a few other apps, it's taking up 16 gigs of RAM. I can't run a VM if I need to test a Windows build for my company. I can't do that. Um, I have to quit all my apps, and I have to interrupt my workflow, and it's killing me. It takes time to quit all that stuff and reopen it and switch things when I should be able to help have it open. The speed doesn't matter. It's the size. Yeah, I I think that. I mean, we're at a point in time where, you know, the speed is already pretty fast as it is. Mm -hmm. You know, and and the the apps, the operating systems, and everything have been designed to better perform on that. But still, it comes down to how much you have. So, okay. So I know, like, uh, well, actually, I'm going to move that question for later on that just came in. So the next one is obviously the graphics card. You know, I remember Pepperidge Farm remembers when AMD actually made incredible CPUs and GPUs. When, when AMD was a company? Yeah. Well, well ATI. <laughs> yeah, ATI. Yeah. Um, but what, what what's up with this? Because now, if you, I don't know if you noticed, but NVIDIA just posted uh, job listings looking for engineers to work on an Apple project. So does that mean Apple's going back to NVIDIA? Have they realized their mistake with AMD? I mean, yes, I get it. They've developed Final Cut X to, you know, be, I guess, optimized on AMD. But there mm-hmm. isn't a single professional user that's using Final Cut X. I think that what they did with their software, now they're doing with their hardware. They're dumbing it down and basically making mm-hmm. it look like they're free versions. So if you use Premiere, if you use Avid, if you use any professional real-world video software, it's all optimized for CUDA cores. Is Apple? Do you, you guys think Apple's going to go back to NVIDIA, or are we going to be stuck with these subpar GPUs? I think if they do, it'll be a while. I think I'm hoping we see it sooner rather than later. Mm-hmm. Um, I think Apple has realized, like, 
uh, NVIDIA, especially with their Pascal architecture, really, really pulled ahead. They completely changed the game this year. Uh, it was an absolute game changer. Um, you know, twice as fast as their, you know, or at the same speed of their existing GPUs with the lower end, it, it, faster than a Titan X. It's incredible. Um, I'm literally speechless. And Apple, I think, is realizing that as well. They've seen mm -hmm. how far they've pulled ahead. They hired that engineer to get more drivers. I mean, NVIDIA keeps Mac drivers. If you have an eGPU, mm -hmm. you can use the 1080 on your Mac. Um, it's, you know, it just takes a little bit of work. And so I think, I think we're going to see them coming back. Um, Apple made the choice of AMD for power reasons. If you look, it's using like 46 watts versus a 1070 or a 1060, I think was using like 85, mm -hmm. a 1070 was pushing 100. That's a lot of power for a machine. Um, so I think Apple chose for power, uh, but they made a mistake. Yeah, and especially when you're talking about like the pro line. The pro line, you're gonna need more power to run. I mean, you're gonna want more performance. But I think, again, like you say, they went for the lower power consumption. And I think they also probably made a good deal with AMD and said, okay, you know, you guys are struggling. <laughs> Let's make a deal and get a better deal on this instead of actually, we're, you know, it goes back to what we talked about earlier about, you know, Steve Jobs and everything. The visionary piece isn't there anymore. Yeah. But it's just how how a cost effective can we make this and get it out? It, it's not really about necessarily being innovative and being the best. It's I mean, it's kind of clear that, you know, there's one part of Apple that's trying to make this Mac Pro be a desktop slash laptop, right? Hence mm -hmm. the four USB-C ports. I'm really surprised that Apple has not made an official eGPU kit because it's amazing that just to get the case, not even the power supply, just a case for an eGPU, it's anywhere between two and $500, which mm -hmm. blows my mind. I've actually been playing around with it because now that I learned that you can run the 1080 on a you know, MacBook Pro, I'm like, okay, that's that's pretty exciting. Let's see if I can do something to further upgrade my machine. Uh, but then on the other side of it was Thunderbolt, which to me I thought was the biggest disappointment. When they first announced, announced it as, what the hell was the original name? With the, uh, do you guys remember the actual name for Thunderbolt? I can't remember the name of it, but I know what you're talking about. They had like yeah, some, so yeah. some sort of copper link with Intel processor, whatever the BS was. The idea was you could plug anything in there and just upgrade your computer to this giant monstrosity, almost like the Trapper Keeper from South Park. You just keep throwing stuff at it and it gets bigger and bigger. So they, you know, they painted the, uh, a world of where you can plug in additional processors to your Mac and additional RAM uh, banks to your mm -hmm. Mac and suddenly you've got this bigger and more powerful machine as a desktop. That never happened. All that we got were 4K displays and big hard drives, now the eGPUs, which is pretty exciting. But I'm kind of hoping that we see something more with the USB-C. That all being said, you know, ultimately it just comes down to the processor. This has been my rant and rave, not on Apple, but just in general. In the last four years, all mobile processors have really seen is maybe a 0.4 bump in speed mm -hmm. and two more cores. Am I missing something here? Well, yeah. Um, really, when you come to processor technology, we're reaching the limits of the technology we have. Mm -hmm. We're not going to get much smaller than 10 nanometers. Uh, Intel is not making any progress. So what options do they have in the same size processor? If they can shrink them a little, they can add a couple cores. Um, clock speed isn't as much of an issue when you have four processors because parallel processing is, you know, you're not using those full processors mm -hmm. anyway right now. So I, I think Intel's hitting a wall. Um, if you look over on the AMD side, they have processors, you know, getting much faster than yeah. Intel's, but their performance is much lower. So it's not all about clock speed. Mm -hmm. So, how, but how many apps are actually taking advantage? Because I guess this is more on on the programming side. How many apps are actually taking advantage of the parallel processing and multi-core? Because there's still some apps that only use two cores when you know it's a four-core processor. Well, um, as a programmer for Apple platforms, I can actually speak to this in depth. We have a, a technology called Grand Central Dispatch, mm -hmm. which makes it really easy to automatically thread your iOS and Mac applications. Um, and any app that's built to take advantage of that, like the apps I built, um, are taking full advantage of those processors. You know, we, um, for the one application I do, we do pinging. We have to ping about 400 different servers. And so we're able to spin up 20 ping threads and massively you know do those things incredibly quickly whereas before it took a long time so you know apps can easily take advantage of that on the mac platform and i think it's one of their strengths so 
so basically, if you know, and I remember, I've actually been trying to get a hold of a 2016 Mac Pro to run benchmarks. I remember when you could walk into an Apple store and actually do benchmark testing. Now you can't even do yeah, that anymore. Yeah, I'm so locked down. But I'm hearing that. You know, again, the 2012 i7, which to me is still one hell of a processor. It runs fast. It'll cook a grilled cheese for you. Guys, I'm not kidding. Put your Mac upside down, run it hot, it'll cook a grilled cheese. But, I mean, it, it, it's a good processor. But I've heard it really isn't that much slower or slower than a 2016, comparatively speaking. Are we going to see anything major happen in processors again, or have we plateaued? Well, it, when it comes to processors, you always hit plateaus. And that's just the history. That's how it's always been. I mean, there's time for re R and D, but also for actually perfecting the technology. You know, you look at what you know some of the universities and stuff are out there have done. They've already broken a lot of those thresholds and stuff. But it's going to take time for you know Intel and AMD to really start taking advantage of that technology, actually being able to make it effective and actually make it reproducible and cost effective for them. You know. What, what, when you look at Intel and them, you know, they're looking 10, 15 years down the line. You know, we may look at right now and go, well, there's nothing new coming up, but it's like there is. It's just it takes a lot of time to develop that, really. It, it, a part of me, I don't know maybe if this is because I'm too narrow minded, but is it maybe because AMD and Intel are focusing on everything else but processors? I mean, you're seeing Intel entering mm -hmm. the drone market, they're trying to do stuff in the DJ market. Now they're trying to do, from what I understand, they're doing something with the video editing market. You know, they're trying to release software for that. Mm -hmm. They're supposed to be focusing on processors. And I feel like that's, you know, like the very last things. Like suddenly Intel is no longer a processor company. It's a everything company that involves everything but a processor company. And with that being said, is it eventually going to come to a point that Apple's going to say, you know what, we make our chips for everything else. Why are we not mm -hmm. making them for our computers? And then what well happens? Uh, this is something that is actually happening kind of in the entire tech industry. You're, you're seeing it all around. Everybody's trying to diversify and get into a little of everything. I, I think you're going to see that happen for a few more years. And then you're going to start to see, you're obviously seeing some quality drop in their main lines and everything. But I think you're going to see them start to come back to what they were good at. You know, it, it's, you look at, you know, companies like, look at Dell, you know, with their acquisition of EMC and everything. Yeah, it was a big change. They've diversified and bought up all these other companies. But now what they're trying to do is they're trying to actually consolidate back down to, okay, here are our core lines. Here's what we do. And actually get back, focus back on what they do. Yeah, but those, Mike, but those companies didn't have a designer that thinks that they are literally on top of the world because they are and they can yeah. do whatever they want and they have a million yeah. lemmings that will swallow it. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know. Can, do you guys think, because I think they are, I think eventually Apple's going to say, this new MacBook is going to come with our own processor. Oh, I think so. And I, I, Kevin, I imagine from a developer's point of view, that's going to be a pain in the ass having to go back to Rosetta again to translate everything, no? I mean, Apple has always done a really great job. I was building Mac apps um, in the Rosetta days. Um, I had one of the first Intel Macs and was playing with that from day one. And Apple had a seamless transition for developers. Unless you had assembly language code, you didn't have to do anything. Um, and I think most Mac developers won't have to do anything at all uh, to switch to ARM. Um, that said, I wanted to speak back for a minute on uh, what we were talking about with Intel um, and specifically their diversifying lines. I think part of the issue is that processor technology is peaked, but in the same time, GPU technology is carrying the Moore's Law torch with, you know, the just looking at Pascal from NVIDIA this year, they, you know, ridiculously improved their performance. Um, by leaps and bounds, and they've done it for like the past five years. Yeah. Every year they're just like doubling their performance. So um, that those CUDA cores, as uh, Dane mentioned, are like having or uh, somebody did that. They're the key, I think, um, going forward for a lot of processing uh, that we're going to be using. So I think that's why companies are putting their effort there. Mm -hmm. So if if Apple does switch to ARM, is that the end of boot camp? Or would ARM run on the same x86 architecture that Intel does? Because a lot of people use their MacBook Pros, ironically enough, to run Windows. Mm -hmm. I mean, if they do switch, it's going to be quite some time. Um, I, I don't think any, the main industry is switching away from Intel anytime soon, and Apple's not going to push that. That interoperability is part of what sold MacBook Pros uh, to a lot of people. That yeah. They weren't abandoning Windows. They could just boot up into it and use it. Um, and if Apple takes that away, they're going to lose a lot of customers. Mm -hmm. So 
Uh, real quick, we got a couple of questions. Oh, also, Kevin, yeah, you have uh, some distortion coming out of your microphone, sir. Like it's sounding like a robot. Better. Coming out. Yeah, that's much better. Much better. Much no better. more robots. <laughs> uh, yeah, th this headset goes crazy <laughs> after like a half an hour. It just it goes nuts. Yeah, I just I was I was trying to uh, didn't know it. I thought it was just me, but apparently somebody else heard it too. Okay, mm -hmm. so before we answer the questions and kind of wrap things up, let's play the blame game for a second. I mean, would you guys say that this is more Tim Cook being completely out of touch oh. or not having that same vision that Steve Jobs has, or is oh, it yeah. that they put Johnny Ive in charge of design, not just in terms of aesthetics, because Johnny Ive can make beautiful hardware. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's no doubt about it. But can he make functional hardware? You know, they put him in charge of iOS after the whole Scott Forstall Apple Maps fiasco. Yeah. So is it Johnny Ive? Because College Humor just did a film making fun about that <laughs> too. Or is it Tim Cook? I mean, who would you guys say is really the big problem? And if somebody uh, had to go, who is it? I think Tim Cook's the problem. I mean, you, you look at the difference between when, you know, b before he took over. I mean, Johnny Ive's been with Apple for how many years now? I mean, decades. And, but so you know, is Tim he, Cook. Well, not in the same uh, you know capacity, but you know I, I feel like the difference was before you had a lot more visionaries on that leadership team, and you know since Jobs passed away, the visionaries really aren't there, you know, and, and I feel like that's what kind of always made Apple who they were. And you look at the times that. Jobs was fired from Apple and left Apple and the quality went downhill and everything. And it took him coming back and saying, we need to stop focusing just on our investors and we actually need to look at being visionaries and you know creating great products and you yeah. know, being innovative and being a step ahead of everyone and knowing what the consumers want. And I just, I think Tim Cook is just not what they need right now to get that done. You know, I think you're exactly right there, Dane, uh, especially with the the innovators. So I know I'm an innovator and I work best when I have people to argue with. Yes. When I work in a vacuum, yep. my ideas, they start to get polluted. They, they're not as good. Um, I agree with you. <laughs> yep. And so when you're in a position of power, like Steve Jobs, Scott Forstall and Johnny Ive were all kind of on the same mm -hmm. playing field. They were equals and they fought. Mm -hmm. I'm sure there were huge oh, yeah. arguments. I mean, the whole skeuomorphism conflict. You know, there were clear fights about that. Um, and they ha Apple had better products because of those fights. Um, and I think part of it is now you have Tim Cook. He's not arguing for anything. He's listening and like, oh, we should do that. Okay. Uh, that mm -hmm. seems like a good idea. Johnny Ive is doing whatever the heck he does all by himself. And <laughs> people, people aren't fighting anymore, um, like friendly competition, but there isn't that, that battle of ideas going on in Apple. And it's really clear. Uh, they're, oh, yeah. they're, they're building products in a, a vacuum and they're not, they're not thinking about everything. Oh yeah. I think you hit it right on the nail right in the head there with, you know, you, you need someone to argue with, like without the arguing back and forth, you know, Steve jobs is very much said about when he would say, I want this to be in the product. And his engineers would be, come back and say, it can't have. He says, I don't care. It's happening. You yeah. need to do it. And, you know, someone else would in the position to be like, okay, we'll, we'll do it. He said, no, we're not releasing it without <laughs> this. We need to do that. And they would get into giant arguments. I just don't think that's happening anymore. Well, that and I think the fact that they're sitting on, what, $700 billion in cash kind of made yeah. them complacent with themselves. Yeah. And, and you know, I know that, Dane, you had mentioned this, that, there's not many hardware patents anymore. You know, the Mac mm -hmm. Pro, just to touch briefly on that, I don't think there's going to be a Mac Pro anymore. There wasn't one this no. year, and those kind of Pro users want to see an update at least every year. Oh, yeah. You know, it used to be, years ago, it used to be that Apple would release a new computer every couple of years, and it would be huge as far as, you know, an option they would add. Oh, it, yeah. It was never the fastest hardware. Apple was never about the fastest hardware. They're like Nintendo, but it was really about making things to work well together. And for the most part, Everything went well. But now when they enter that Mac Pro field, first of all, they went into that garbage can design, which is stupid, but whatever. Oh. They went into the garbage can design, and now it's like com completely quiet. Meanwhile, mm -hmm. the Apple TV, which was a little hobby project, they're spending yeah, they time. They said they were canceling three times. Yeah, they're, they're spending time putting things on that that don't even matter. Mm hmm so in defense of the apple tv i have one and really love it oh i, I have like four of them i love them too yeah. <laughs> they're, they're the best things ever i i if you don't have it or haven't tried one of those you gotta grab one 
No, they are, but but you, you know what I mean? It's like Apple used to have two really distinct markets. They used to have their small hobby market. That's literally what Steve Jobs called it, and they let the product grow on its own. It was a viral growth, and that's what happened with Apple TV. You know, he just knew that cable companies were going to screw themselves and Apple TV would grow in popularity, and that's what it did. He let it just ride on those coattails, and then they have their pro division. They were big machines, they were heavy, and they were expensive, oh, yeah. and that's the way that it should be. Nobody ever bought a MacBook Pro. Again, I'll say the 2011, 2012, nobody ever bought that looking for a sleek machine that mm -hmm. didn't drink a lot of, uh, you know, that the lasted forever on a battery charge. I mean, mine, I, I got four hours when I used it full. Now I'm lucky if I get an hour out of it. And nobody ever bought a MacBook Pro waiting for it to be just a nice, cool running machine. Now it seems yeah. like they're trying to hit, they're trying to make the world's most powerful Facebooking machine. Yeah, you know, and yeah, the USB C. There, there are some exciting things. There's plenty of exciting things about USB C. Though now, Dane, you're saying that you read that you can't run a, an Apple 4K uh, display. What I was reading, let me pull up this one. I was reading here, and while you say, was saying that, um, where is it here? Because that would be news to me. That would be stupid if they if they drop support or display for our support. For Thunderbolt displays. Yeah, it says it doesn't work with Thunderbolt display. Bad news for all owners of Mac Apple Thunderbolt displays. The new MacBook Pro is not compatible with that. Ouch. What? Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Can you uh, can you link me to that real quick, and I'll post it up uh, on the screen so people yeah. can see it. So let's real quick answer some questions here, or uh, people have asked. Uh, Day and I DJs asked, do external hard drives work slower than an internal? I personally think they used to, not anymore. I mean, not anymore. There, there's definitely going to be some sort of bottleneck, but I don't think anything we would notice. I mean, it's if you're copying a lot of files, it's going to take a little longer. Yeah. But if you're just day-to-day -day stuff, it's not going to be noticeable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like you know, and I see SATA that you know, okay, six gigs per second transfer speed, but I've never had a hard drive give me six gigs mm -hmm. a second of data transfer speed. So I don't think that's the bottleneck there. If, if you did use USB or USB-C. Uh, Trevor asked about putting touchscreens on their laptop. And I know that Phil Schiller said that it was a waste and it was a horrendous user, the user experience. And I get it. OS X is not a touch OS and we can't have another Windows 8 fiasco. Oh, God, no. But why not both? I think Windows 10 did a really good job balancing between a touchscreen option and a non-touchscreen option. I mean, Windows 10 is not the most reliable OS, but no, boy, but Microsoft fixed a lot learn, with that one. Learn from Microsoft's failures. You can do it without being all out. Yeah. Because eight. I, <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. I, I got to agree. And if you look at those Surface tablets, the Surface books, they're as thick. They're an inch thick almost. They're the same size as a 2012 MacBook Pro. Nobody cares. Mm -hmm. And the people love that. There's the Razer Pro, um, a Razer Blade now that has a 1060, mm -hmm. 32 gigs of RAM, and it's the size of a current Retina. Um, yeah. You know, like that, there's real hardware innovation coming out of Windows, and they've got the touchscreen. They're actually pretty cool. Yep. Trevor, I think part of the reason you won't see touchscreens is because Apple wants to make them so thin. And two things happen when you make them thin. Those hinges on the actual monitors become more mm -hmm. fragile. If you're sitting there touching your monitor after a while, the hinges break. Case in point, the original iBook. I mean, if you moved it too many times, it would snap in half. Mm -hmm. um, and then if you wanted to bend all the way back to be a convertible, which after using the Mac Pro, I really think Apple should go this route. So if you wanted to go all the way back, you're going to need to have it be thicker than a, a half inch. And that's not even just hardware or hardware innovation. That's just physics. Metal doesn't bend in that direction and not fall mm -hmm. apart after a while unless they come up with some sort of revolutionary new material. I um, think Apple really needs to start segregating their lines and just say, you know what? This is a professional laptop. This is a consumer laptop. Absolutely. Um, Entertainment Sound and Solution Lighting says, I think Apple is getting greedy. Yep, products are getting overpriced. <laughs> and all they're doing is removing technology from their products. So when the 2016 MacBook came out, I mean, I, you know, Monica and I talked about it. because She's like, you know, you're eventually going to have to upgrade. You can't stick with the 2012 the rest of your life. And that's what, what it's looking that? like right now. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, that's what it's looking like. Right so I compared. You know, I, I basically took the new 2016. I put 16 gigs of RAM, a 2 terabyte SSD in there. And it was almost four thousand dollars. Like I paid thirty five oh, yeah. for my forty four hundred. Yeah, forty four if you want to max it out with like the four gig card and yeah. the higher processor and all that. And I'm like, really? That's it? Point four? Not even point four? Like point three gigahertz speed increase yeah. and two uh, the two extra cores. And yeah, the two cores make a big deal. 
but it wasn't, you know, it wasn't like twice the performance. I don't think it was like 50%, 60% faster. It was something Not to mention that. that hardware comparison, what you could buy a Windows machine for. For 3,800, you can get a Razer Blade with 32 gigs of RAM and a 1060. Oh, that will, 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 that'll just blow that new MacBook oh, yeah. out of the water all day long. I'm almost thinking of buying one. They, those are nice computers. I, I think what's going to happen, I know Apple has sued everybody mm -hmm. that has tried, but I think you're going to see, especially companies like Acer or even MSI, because I know MSI just released a uh, laptop too, but I think you're going to see them doing using hardware that's Mac friendly, mm -hmm. so that way you can easily hack and tosh it straight out of the box. It's going to happen, and I think when that does, it's going to change everything, because ultimately for me, my love of Apple comes from the OS. The OS works mm -hmm. great. It's easy to run. I know a lot of developers prefer developing on Mac. Kevin, I don't know if you develop on PC or not, but do you or no? Nope, so you're mostly <laughs> Mac. <laughs> and, and by the way, kudos on Mac for not just really releasing Swift, but releasing hundreds of educational courses oh, behind yeah. it, like even right down I, for I, little kids. I really like that. Yeah. So um, let's see here. And I think that's really all the questions. Uh, somebody said they aren't innovating anymore. And, you know, somebody made the joke that they used to copy and paste. And, yeah, they used to copy and paste as far as, like, Xerox. But the difference mm -hmm. is Steve Jobs was one hell of a marketer. You mm -hmm. know, he could take a technology that was already there and say, hey, look, we brought this. <laughs> Xerox, you should have known better. There, well, there was a reason they beat out IBM right over right off the bat because IBM didn't have a Steve Jobs. Yeah. Um, let's see here. Yep, somebody else said the same thing. They spec'd one of the MacBook side. It was gonna be forty five hundred dollars. So, mm -hmm. I don't know. So, I, sorry. So here, here's here's a question I've got for you guys: Is looking forward with Apple, you know, with their innovation, you know, they're going to be moving into campus too. Here, we're gonna see in what first or second quarter of twenty seventeen, and into their new giant R and D facility, and you know growing their teams and everything do you foresee that may, making any big changes in their actual r d historically speaking big companies when they go from their old office to their shiny new campus mm -hmm. always suffer big problems yeah mm -hmm. um i think we saw that with ge we saw that with microsoft we've seen it with other companies that they they get a lot of money they're really successful they build a giant new headquarters and then they take a crap. Yeah. No, absolutely. And again, it's also like you said, is that our, is the in-house arguing going to happen again? Yeah. You know, there, there needs to be a very headstrong personality. It's, Oh yeah. That's the thing, you know, we've, we've mentioned this before in previous streams, Dane, nobody builds a powerful company by being nice. And no. Tim cook is a very nice guy. I don't even think, he yells at people behind, like Steve Jobs. You can look at him like, yeah, this guy's an asshole to his employees. <laughs> I don't know if Tim Cook is that way. I, I, I could see Phil Schiller, and I'll be honest with you. When you know Steve Jobs said he was gonna, you know, step down, I really had hope they it's were gonna put Phil Schiller. Schiller. I don't know what it is about Phil Schiller. I really like Phil Schiller, and you could tell, like with the i or the iPhone Seven, when he called the removal of the Jack Brave, you knew, like you could tell, like yeah, he's he's not digging oh, yeah. this. <laughs> so somebody made him tell that because I mean he was grimacing <laughs> as he was saying it, and maybe I'm you know overlooking or, or I mean uh, looking at it too hard, but he just didn't seem too happy saying that. Mm. In a way, I do agree with removing the headphone jack, and we've talked about it before. Uh, when mm -hmm. I was doing a live stream, I totally got pissed about not having the headphone jack. But otherwise, you know, whatever. In this day and age of Bluetooth, the headphone jack is useless. But I'll tell you what I am really annoyed at. I've got this really nice, super powerful iPhone that I can run Lightroom on. I can do all my regular apps out of my iPad Pro. And yet Apple refuses to do support for the pencil. Just yeah. li little things like that. There's no reason for it. Um and then now that you had mentioned about the displays, I had just pulled this up. That was one of the things I wanted to talk about. I don't know if you guys have heard. Apple stopped. That their display line apparently is gone, and they're partnering mm -hmm. with LG to do a whole new line of displays. So yeah. I don't think it's that they can't support the new or the current displays. I think they don't want to to force mm -hmm. people to upgrade. Well, also, they just dropped support for the airport line. Uh, the oh, airport that's right, base yeah. stations, the time capsule. Mm -hmm. I mean, in one sense, they seem to be narrowing. But in another sense, there are five iPads on sale, including the iPad yeah. Mini 2, which is completely worthless. No one should buy one of those. It is mm -hmm. too old. The 3 is too old. The 4 is aging. Um, you know, but there, there are so many iPads on sale. Um, Same with are, iPhones. I mean, oh, they, yeah. how, how many iPhones are selling at a time? Four or five? 
just of one model and you talk about they're selling three or four generations still I, I mean steve jobs if he was still here you would have three ipads they would be almost identical inside maybe with different amounts of ram and you'd have a you know 7.9 a 9.7 and a 12.9 mm -hmm. same with iphone they'd all be iphone not iphone 7 iPhone. You guys remember the next iPad? Yeah. That was one yeah. of the first things. You know, like you'd have one iPhone, three sizes, pick your size, pick your color, pick your hard drive, bam, you're done. Um, and that was what Jobs is all about. You know, the same thing even with MacBook Pros. It was like you pick your size, you pick your color, mm -hmm. you pick, you know, options, and then you're done. Um, and, and they're getting rid of that. I, like they're, they've lost sight. I, I think we talked we talk about this earlier too about how they've gotten too much money they've gotten too greedy and, and they're really at that point where like you say without anybody arguing internally somebody goes hey i was thinking we should do this yeah sounds like a good idea we got the money why not oh that it, touch it, bar it, seems it, like a great idea yeah <laughs> i guess I don't know, I'm, I'm so iffy on that touch bar it, it, it did look really cool but i have gone this entire time without the touch bar and yeah. as Kevin said, that escape key, I need that escape key. And the, the part that bugged me is Apple immediately released a support article about it saying, well, you could map any key to be your escape key. Okay, geniuses, no pun intended. What key <laughs> should I map to be my escape key? Should I, like, <laughs> yeah, that's the, it. The escape key should be. <laughs> you know what? It, it, that should actually come default. So next time yeah. you're arguing with some idiot on Facebook, instead of, you know, they try to do the caps lock, they just wind up closing that screen entirely. <laughs> <laughs> It's, I don't know. There are there are a lot of programming hipsters that have switched their caps lock to escape. So I mean, there is a little precedent for that um, for hipsters. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> so and, and well, and that's the other one. It's you know, Apple has always been all about developers, developers, developers. You know, uh, well, actually, that was Steve Ballmer that said that. But still, Apple has always been all about developers, and now it seems like they have alienated a lot of developers. That's why I was kind of surprised that you said that you like that keyboard because I could not imagine typing code on that keyboard the entire day. I barely wanted to type my name on that keyboard. I mean, and then you have, too, Microsoft just released Visual Studio for Mac. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so you can now build iOS and I'm pretty sure Mac applications in C Sharp on your Mac with Visual Studio. And Xcode, frankly, yeah. is garbage software. It needs to die in a dumpster fire. <laughs> if I could write Objective-C and Swift yeah. and Visual Studio, I would switch in a second. Oh, I already yeah. use app code. I hate Xcode so much. Well, and I think one of the things too, you talk about we, we're seeing in the programming world, I'm sure you see this a lot, is for a while there, it seemed like there were so many new languages in this language, this language we, and now we're narrowing back down to like you say, like Objective-C and stuff the core you know coding whereas you know for a while there it was oh well there's this new one there's this new one there's this new one. we're getting back to narrow again where you know you shouldn't need to know seven or eight different languages to exactly uh, a couple of things trevor said that you know you mentioned about the rumors about the iphone 8 having uh led display i don't know why we're talking about the iphone 8 or why anybody's talking about it because mm -hmm. there's absolutely no way anything's going to leak out right now and i don't believe apple accidentally leaks things out the iphone 4 being left in a bar come on there was no way that was accident. it's all part of their marketing they don't spend the money in marketing yeah, they they've, they've, they've got the cone of silence for a reason yep. i don't think they're going to leak anything out right now as hot as the iphone 7 is currently if, selling if they actually had something like that that they didn't want to get out it wouldn't get out but OLED. what did you hear about the watch before it came out nothing exactly yeah. <laughs> so, everybody speculated just like apple tv coming back everybody thought apple tv was completely dead and apple told everybody it was dead yep until they said wait we got one more thing so i mean well i mean granted we all knew that apple was going to eventually do a watch but yeah. not the way that they did it like that but i mean oled screens are still expensive and i really think that that little touch bar is adding quite a bit to that cost uh, but OLED is still pretty expensive, and as far as an OLED keyboard, that's not going to happen anytime soon. But I honestly do believe the 2017 MacBook, unless Apple goes, whoops, un you know, unless they do that, the 2017 MacBook Pro is going to have no keyboard whatsoever. It's just going to be two screens, and that's it. Because you can make it even thinner by removing the actual mechanical part of the key. I hope not. I hope not. No, you know, but but again, I, I feel like, and, and I, I've been a big iPhone fan since the beginning and everything. But I feel like the i iOS line, the OS X line, there's just no strategic path anymore, or 
you know, what what our next step is anymore. It's just kind of like, eh. Yeah. I mean, all we've seen lately is continuity. Oh, yeah. I can unlock my f computer with my watch, but not yeah. my 2012 <laughs> MacBook Pro for no good reason. Yeah, that, that won't bug me because I was actually kind of excited about them. Like, oh, that's actually pretty cool. I can unlock it. Nope. Because as a you know again as a DJ if I step away from my system or heck even as a, just a, any professional you step away from your MacBook for a second maybe grab yourself a cup of coffee you don't want somebody to come in and kind of snooping through your stuff especially in a sensitive corporate environment but if you're using one of the more popular laptops uh, nope sorry you can't do that you know even AirDrop doesn't work for no damn reason and mm -hmm. I think it's just to force people to upgrade on these really gimmicky things. I don't want a thin MacBook. I want something with a real processor, or a real GPU, or at the very least, easier access that, okay, fine, if you want to give me an ultra-thin, powerful laptop, that's fine. But when I dock it, I want to have access to the better GPU. I yeah. want to be able to have access to better RAM. I don't know if you can put RAM on USB-C, but I know you can put an SSD on RAM. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you guys have seen this, but there's a company Ram that sells RAM sticks been, with been, an M2 slot. Yeah. I didn't know that. Like, I just learned it like two days ago. I'm like, huh, <laughs> how the hell does that work? So I didn't know, okay, maybe USB-C could be used for RAM, but mm -hmm. I don't know. Actually, not quite there yet. Not, okay, so what would the difference be? If you remember, oh God, back in the days, was it Windows 98 or 2000? Where, no, I guess it was XP, the, uh, where you could plug in a USB and use it as a scratch disk. And Microsoft would treat it almost like they did with RAM. Do you remember that failure? Mm -hmm. I mean, you can still do that. You can put your swap file anywhere yeah. on today. You just don't want to. Yeah. No kidding. I remember back, actually back with Mac, back on the days of Apple Talk. No. <laughs> I remember. Oh, uh, so, okay. So I guess that being said, we are you know kind of running out of time. Unless there's anything you guys would like to kind of mention. Kevin, I know you had a lot of rants. I don't know if there was anything else you wanted to rant about regarding the Apple direction that they're going or misdirection. Uh, no, I think we touched on every single thing I had to say about this. I, I'm pretty pleased. Awesome. Guys, again, thank you all so much for tuning in. Uh, Dane, thank you very much. Kevin, thank you very much, guys, for coming on board. Uh, if you guys have any questions, please leave them in the comments below. Make sure to like, share, subscribe to your friends. Have a great evening and God bless. Hold on.